I hope the PPT is visible. Our today's topic is adaptation of short stories and dramas. So, like till last class, we were basically talking about the issues that we normally face in the process of adaptation. But then again, like translation, uh, adaptation is a process where the individual agency is very powerful. So, how a person uh, would tackle that issue is completely a personal matter and primarily about the objective of the person who is uh, making the film. So, today we will talk about certain uh, important stories and dramas which have been adapted into you know, films. So let's begin today's class. When we say that adaptation from the short story, we will also have to understand what is a short story. Okay. Because everything is a story. So in traditional literary terms, stories have been defined. So, majority of the directors have selected short stories for their uh, cinematic adaptation because uh, there the directors can add a lot of new things. Plus, stories normally have certain appealing themes. And uh, this is a kind of literary work where you don't have to spend too much time in reading and working on the story. But, as mentioned earlier, short stories may not be able to give enough content for a full-length film. Okay. As most of the short stories that we encounter are like 5 pages, 6 pages, 10 pages. And it may not give us enough content to make a full-length script for the film. And hence, uh, there are a lot of addition and changes needed to be done in the basic structure of the short story to adapt it into a full-length film. Uh, a piece of prose fiction that can typically be read in a single sitting and focuses on a self-contained incident or series of linked incidents with the intent of evoking a single effect or mood. That is how this short story is defined in literature. So there are a few important aspects here that it is self-contained. It can be read in a single sitting and mostly it is uh, about a particular mood or effect. In many cases, the narrative of short story begins in middle and through flashbacks we know what had happened before the main event that is mostly the short stories begin somewhere uh, at the main event of that story main incident of the story and probably through the uh, communication of the characters or through some flashbacks uh, we will know that what actually happened before these events and how these characters are involved here. This is actually, uh, even in terms of developing a script, this is one of the very interesting ways of uh, creating a good thrillers and suspense films. That uh, the audience is completely clueless. We directly introduce to an event and some characters associated with that event. We don't know the background of those characters and we don't even know what will happen further. So these kind of stories are uh, probably some of the best adapted stories for the screen. Uh, in traditional sense, everywhere in the world, uh, short stories of Arabian Nights, Panchatantra, as of fables, etc., are some of the most adapted short stories across the world. They may not be adapted in their literal sense, the way the stories were written, 
uh, and published in those books. But uh, they will be modified in terms of uh, the modern requirements of the audience. Okay. So some of these are adapted in its original form and some of them are modernized in the adaptation process. In fact, in in like last 20-25 years, majority of these uh, Panch Tantra and Arabian Night and Aesop Fables and all, they have been modified into something modern and uh, adapted for uh, the screen. Uh, there was an uh, interesting movie, Hindi movie called Mirch, uh, which has also uh, adapted uh, the stories from these kind of fables. But all of them were modified for the screen. This is one very interesting film, though it was again considered a parallel cinema. It is called Katha. Katha basically means story. Okay. And uh, this particular film, which was released in 1983, was directed by Sai Paranjepe. And it was based on famous short story of Hare and Tortoise, where one hero is a personification of Hare, that in this case, uh, the first hero that is we see in the picture poster, Farooq Sheikh, was in the role of Hare, and the other hero that is Nasiruddin Shah was the tortoise. And they are racing to achieve the favors of the heroine. Okay. So, if if we uh, go by the standard idea of the short story Hare and Tortoise, uh, there's nothing directly associated with that story. But uh, the idea that um, overconfident Hare uh, normally loses. That idea was basically modified into something uh, modern scenario and presented in a very uh, romantic and comic manner. And its title itself is basically implicative of uh, the uh, what we call director's objective when he or she uh, she is basically here making this film. Uh, there is one very interesting. Uh, horror film, Asimi's horror film uh, is called Kotha Nodi. I don't know how many of us are aware about it, but that was again most of the stories. There were four stories. Uh, so those stories were basically taken from the folklores and they are created into one interesting interconnected uh, film. It was very, very well-made film and very interesting stories were selected. So if you get a chance, please watch it. So there is, like when we are adapting a short story or we are adapting any form of work of art, we require modifications. But what kind of modifications are possible when we call it a short story? Okay. So selection of a short story is mostly to represent some specific reading of the director. It is rarely presented just because they are short stories. Director is reading that story and something appeals in that story. Or probably director is looking for some good idea and because of this short story that the direct director is reading, that something clicks and director tries modifying the story to adapt for the screen. So in majority of the cases that we have seen of short stories, the original theme of the short story uh, has been modified for the uh, screening purposes. Like we talked about this in previous two classes as well. Arrival. Okay. Now arrival, as I said in last class, that it was actually in, in terms of short story or in terms of novella, uh, it was a story about a mother's emotions for her daughter. But when uh, Dennis Villeneuve selects that particular uh, story, his concerns are primarily 
in terms of making a science fiction. So, so based on Ted Chiang's novella, Arrival primarily represents the global crisis and the role of U.S. linguist in decoding the ma language of the haptopods. Well, the story was more about a mother's futuristic communication with a daughter. So, uh, in the in the film, there were there has been so many things which are added, which have been modified, like uh, the heroine develops the entire uh, language, and then later on she writes uh, a book on the language of these uh, aliens and how she stopped a kind of global crisis. So all those things were so foregrounded that. The actual story that was written by Ted Chiang and primarily about the heroine and her daughter was somewhere in the background. And in fact, as, a, as an audience, uh, if you're not aware about the actual story, you may not pay much attention on that uh, parallel plot of the daughter. Uh, similarly, Mirch Mashala. Okay. So, Mich Masala is a Hindi uh, film and it was based on a Gujarati short story. Uh, based on a Gujarati short story by Chunilal Maria. Chunilal Maria is one of the very important Gujarati, was a Gujarati writer and he has written some of the very, very interesting short stories. So, that short story is primarily about uh, this gatekeeper that we can see here, this Muslim man in the middle, the story was about this person. And the title of the story was also Abu Makrani. Okay. That it was not a story of this uh, heroine, Son, Son Bai, or it was not even a story of uh, this, uh, what do we call, officer of the East India Company, Basically, he was Indian, uh, but he had that particular village under his control. So he comes there. So the story doesn't even talk about the village. Story doesn't even talk about the villagers. Okay. There are mention of those people that the, what we call Mukhi of the village, head of the village comes uh, to convince uh, this heroine to go and sleep with uh, the Subedar or uh, some other people from the village also come there to convince her. But the entire story takes place within that uh, small uh, factory. Okay. All these uh, what we call victims were inside the factory and uh, these uh, Subedars uh, soldiers were outside the factory and one by one different important villagers uh, come there and try to convince both uh, Abu Makrani, the gatekeeper, and uh, the Sonbai to uh, get out of the factory and go to the Subita. But movie is something very different. In fact, the movie is about village. So the entire politics of the village is involved in the movie. Even the politics related with the women empowerment is involved in the movie. So even uh, there is a story of Sir Panch and his wife that is head of the village and his wife. They have a daughter and this daughter goes to study in the school. And that was actually a talk of the village because in that entire village no other girl was actually studying okay. and in fact uh, these uh, village women actually uh, went against their males and they fought against the soldiers uh, of the subedar okay, in the film right. so there is this huge number of changes because uh, if you read the story the first line of the story uh, in Gujarati uh, is basically uh, something that appears in the 38th minute of the movie. So first, first 38 minutes of the movie was basically a kind of background created. The villagers, 
the village the people of the village the males of the village uh, the subedar and his soldiers and how they were trying to exploit the villagers everything was shown okay, even before the actual story starts and somewhere it 38 minute uh, son by enters into the factory okay saving herself from the soldiers of the subedar and that that was the first line of the story in chunilal maria writes he begins the story uh, with that entry of son by into the factory and in the very first line it was made clear that the soldiers of the subedar are after son by to capture her for subeda so these changes okay, the the actual story was about this abu makrani where he has this conflict of what is my duty and what is my religion because subed uh, the gatekeeper is basically working for that factory the factory owner comes there and tells him that i am ordering you to open the gate and um, put this uh, son by out of the factory so that was actually the order of uh, his honor he should have followed because it becomes part of his duty but at the time he said that my role is uh, of the security i'll have to make sure that all the women in the factory are safe so he doesn't accept the orders of his owners and ultimately he gets killed in that conflict and when he gets killed the story gets over while when he gets killed in the movie and the soldiers entered into the factory then the women of the factory and of the village fought back uh, to soldiers so all those beginning middle what i in, in in that sense we can say that there is a prologue and there is an epilogue of the story but that is incorporated only in the uh, movie not in actual story so uh, movie completely changes its focus from the character of abu makrani to son bai and that's why the title is not abu makrani and even the character is not called abu makrani in the uh film in the the character is known as abu mia not makrani so basically they are highlighting uh his religious identity while if you call it abu makrani then basically you are highlighting his uh, what we call uh special uh, identity that he comes from the area called makran the story was confined to the small factory of spices while the movie expands to the entire village okay this is also a change in the story the factory was of spices while in the uh, movie the factory is of uh, the chili powder all the women there they are making chili powder and they actually use the chili powder as a weapon to fight against the soldiers and the subedar so many people many critics also connects that uh, use of red color and chili powder uh, with the uh, kind of marxist approach to dealing with that film Adopt, adopting from short story in terms of rashomon rashomon again we have talked about this but today we will go in more details so again as i said in last class rashomon uh, uses two short stories okay first is called in a groove and actual plot is from that and rashomon is a second story and basically director uses uh, the what we call background of rashomon short story and used it in the in this story to talk about in a groove okay so we'll see one uh, what we call small uh, short trailer of rashomon so some of you might not have seen the movie so uh, at least with trailer you'll get some idea uh, fortunately this movie is available on youtube so if you want to watch uh, this is an easy way 
so i'll just share the youtube link so kurosawa's rashomon adopts a plot from one short story that is in a groove and setting from another short story that is rashomon in the first story there are witnesses telling the court about the events took place in the groove in that groove basically there is uh, one samurai got killed and samurai's wife uh, was raped by uh, this bandit here so what we see here in the poster the person who is standing is bandit and uh, the woman is the samurai's wife now in the story there is no other description that is the character will come in front of the court and they'll speak what they know about this particular event okay. there is no background information about the characters and there is no connective uh, statements in terms of their uh, testimony to the court so there are six uh, four or five different testimonies but all of them are separate and there is no introduction there is no conclusion so no voice of the author the writer is not giving any judgment about the entire event or as a reader we don't hear the voice from the judges okay. so there is no judgment given so you just hear the testimonies in the short story so through this narrative the reader becomes the judge of the story that as a reader you read all the testimonies and you decide what actually happened who is the really guilty person whether it is the bandit or the woman or somebody else okay. in the movie the stories are presented in the same manner okay that is there is a court and uh, there is what we call shoulder height sequence in the frame we we can see the person who is giving the testimony okay but there is no judge visible in the entire court sequence okay so indirectly the director is converting the audience the in in the what we call position of the judge the characters giving their witness to the court where the audience is the judge so similar to what we had in the story that same technique is used by akura kurosawa to talk about the uh, inner groove's plot but then akira kurosawa adds more information to it okay that there was one person who actually informed the police about this particular uh, murder because he found the dead body in the groove and that was the woodcutter so woodcutter also gives his testimony in story as well as in the film but after everything gets over woodcutter is waiting at the rashomon gate and is waiting for the rain to stop so that he can go home it was raining heavily and in that process there were two other people they started talking about it so now in this case also the rashomon gate becomes a kind of place where the judgment about a particular event and the character of a particular woman or a crime of a particular man is being discussed and we as an audience are the what we call witness to that discussion the original story didn't have a clear end so the director uses another story to give a kind of poetic justice to the entire narrative again even after the discussion at the rashomon gate we don't come to know who was the real 
culprit. But we have been given a kind of poetic justice that the human society is not so bad after all. So here the director uses another story from the same author, Akutagawa, and that story's title was Rashomon. The story Rashomon was about degrading morals of the Japanese society. <coughs> well, in the movie, it presents the original narrative of Rashomon Get, adding the connecting narrative from the previous narrative, that is, in a group. Now, most of the Western uh, interpreters are basically reading this film as a kind of biblical, uh, what we call, uh, recreation. That is, whatever happened in the groove was basically something uh, that was happening in the paradise. That the samurai and his wife were basically symbols of the Adam and Eve, and the bandit was a symbol of the Saturn. And then they connect this rain and Rashomon get that the heavy rain after this event is basically the purification process of the uh, paradise. That's why there is heavy rain. So there are multiple possibilities of interpretations. You haven't been given any specific judgment or any specific interpretation. And this film becomes so important for uh, us, for the people who study cinema, that these kind of stories now known as the Rashomon effect, where you don't have any specific uh, conclusion after the end of the uh, story or a film. Okay. So now if you are simply thinking in terms of loyalty, okay, if Kurosawa would have tried to be loyal to inner groove or to be loyal to Rashomon, he may not have created a great classic movie like Rashomon. So there is something more than loyalty and that is about the kind of message that he wanted to communicate. And that's why he's modifying uh, the original stories and presenting something completely new, a kind of hybrid versions of two stories, but giving us a very, very interesting and powerful narrative about ethics and society. Normally, uh, we think about characters and plot when we are uh, adapting the stories. And most of the stories are character driven or incident driven, so plot based. So now when you are adapting it, whether you will concentrate on some characters or on some plots okay, or some specific incident and the characters are there but in a background and they are just helping the plot to uh, what we call move further. Uh, this uh, 2007 film by Vidhu Vinod Chopra is a Hindi film which was titled Eklavya, The Royal Guard. Now, in a strict sense of the idea of adaptation, this may not fit into it. But then what the director is doing is he has adapted a character from... Um, I think Ramayana, Eklavya was there in Ramayana, right? No, Mahabharata. It was. So Eklavya, <clears throat> the movie is retelling of the epic character of Eklavya, a self-taught archer and warrior who offered his thumb as Guru Dakshina to the Dronacharya. So basically, this particular story is questioning that act of giving his thumb to the Guru. Okay. What kind of loyalty a person may have and can have in 
मॉडर्न टाइम्स दस द एंटायर मूवी अबाउट द मूवी इज इन मॉडर्न टाइम्स वेर एक लव्य इज आउट टू प्रूव हिज लॉयल्टी टू हिज ऑनर्स एंड द फिल्म एसेंशियली क्वेश्चन द सेक्रीफाइस दैट द कैरेक्टर ऑफ एक लव्य दस एंड अटेम्प्ट टू प्रजेंट an alternative narrative and in fact the opening sequence of the movie basically starts with the actual story of eklavya from mahabharat okay and then uh, the the child who is listening to that story is questioning the act of eklavya and then the movie begins interestingly the adaptation process keeps a character in center and develops the narrative so the character of eklavya which is basically adapted so when you go to the f- to to see this film you know that this film is about eklavya and we already know eklavya from our understanding of the mythology so we basically what we call intertextuality we basically understand this text based on our understanding of myth and the role of eklavya in that myth okay so that's where uh, the eklavya's character and the title becomes important but in terms of plot in terms of narrative you don't find anything close to the story of eklavya okay. so only the character is adapted into the film but the plot is completely different similarly this this is a very new and popular film vikram veda in vikram veda which is 2017 film by pushkar and gayatri the original narrative of betal pachishi is adapted in modern timeline so we see two characters here so one is vikram like here in white shirt is vikram and the other one in black shirt is veda so they basically symbolize uh, the king vikram and uh, the betal the uh, what we call evil whom vikram is supposed to capture for the sacrifice so that narrative is accepted and basically the idea and the symbolization of the fight between good versus evil is very very clearly symbolized through these characters and the way betal pachisi proceeds that every time uh, betal is captured he would tell a story and then pose a question in front of vikram and in the process of identifying the answer uh, vikram loses control of betal and betal es- escapes similar thing happens in the film betal is telling stories every time he gets captured by vikram but uh, if you look at these two frames that i'm using here in this the uh, the frame in the corner uh, is from very first sequence when vikram and veda meet and you can see vikram is wearing white shirt and veda is wearing black shirt and black and white are basically used as symbols of good and evil because this was the first uh, sequence and betal that is veda hasn't told any story so far so we were seeing these two characters into these clear frames of good and evil okay okay and that's why their shirts colors are white and black and the second image okay in the center uh, with the title of the movie that image basically uh, from the end of the film okay and we can see both of them are wearing wearing gray shades so that very notion of the symbolization of black and white good versus evil is nullified and in the movie we could see that that uh, whatever is good has something evil in it and whatever was evil had something good in it 
so that gray shade emerges in the end okay so now here the characters and their characteristics have been modified to a large extent but the underlying message that betal pachisi had and vikram um, beda has it is maintained as it is good versus evil so and plus the narrative technique that questions answers and escape that is also maintained in the film so now these are two different uh, manners of adaptations okay there are other manners also but these are uh, basically the most uh, easily identifiable and readily used by the directors when we adopt from drama we have similar but uh, what we call drama is in a way uh, easier form for adaptation because drama is primarily uh, written for the purpose of play it is supposed to be performed so that performativity uh, is basically there uh, in the mind of the drama writer okay so in that sense drama is easiest to adapt compared to other forms of literature because dramas are primarily written for performance it will have specific dialogues like stories don't have many dialogue but if you want to adapt it you will have to create the dialogues you will have to convert the descriptions into dialogues and again in drama you have clearly divided sequences and scenes so the job of the script writer screen writer becomes a little easier because of these formal reasons is easier to develop a screenplay from the drama however adaptation will have its own nuances and may bring some challenges and changes okay, in the process of adapting a drama into a film and in fact majority of the good dramas uh how been uh, adapted into films uh i hope you must be aware about this specific film uh, 12 angry men by sydney lumet okay. this was a radio drama written by regional rose and it was adapted into a movie by sydney lumet now as i said it was a radio drama means the action was not supposed to be visible okay radio drama requires lot of dialogues and conflicts through the dialogues and now sydney lumet decides to adapt this into a visual form into the form of a film okay the primary Uh, what we call challenge here is to create visual that is appealing and that can uh, maintain the interest of the audience for two and a half hours okay so it was a long, long drama and those who have seen the movie uh, will agree that uh, the screen writers have actually done a tremendous job not just writing but also cinematography and acting of all the 12 actors everything was like top notch and you be in the film from the very first frame till the last frame okay and that's where we also see the what we call wonders of writing that how the arguments are being developed and how those arguments are made convincing they were not just convincing for those 12 people but those arguments were also convincing for the audience that you don't just uh, observe that yes these people are agreeing by listening to them you will also agree that nay this is right and that's where uh, this film becomes 
a kind of masterpiece in terms of developing script and presenting a screenplay uh, the the kind of action without action okay and still we are connected now this drama interestingly this particular film is also adapted into hindi uh, which is known as ek ruka hua fensla it was uh, remade in 1986 so almost 30 years after the original film and it was again remade by basu chatterjee now one very significant change that i could observe between these two films is in original uh, film that is 12 angry men there were no visuals of the event that these people were discussing in the entire movie yeah. there are only these 12 people discussing there were no requirement of visuals but when basu chatterjee decides to make it for indian audience basu chatterjee inserts some hypothetical visuals in terms of their discussion for the better understanding of audience not for the people in the room so because probably basu chatterjee was aware that our audience is not that advanced or uh, probably our audience may not enjoy just dialogues so there are very minimal but the insertions of the visuals of the actual event of murder inserted into the discussion and interestingly this film was also adapted in russian it was titled 12 it was made in 2007 by nikita mikhalko it is also adapted into mandarin language okay and it was called 12 citizens and was uh, released in 2015 and directed by anu ang and it was also made into tamil by a santhil kumar in 2016 and it was called vaimai i am not very sure it is pronounced as vaimai or vaimai but li which literally translates as the truth so even after all these years like 2016 so it's like Uh, 57 was the time when the drama was actually uh, created before that the drama was um, written the film was uh, made in 1957 so it's all, almost like 60 years even after 60 years the film and the drama becomes relevant and uh, people are still using that script to create a film i'm yet to find these films i could not find all of them i could see only these two 12 angry men and ek ruka hua fensla and i'm still looking for the russian mandarin and uh, the tamil language <clears throat> another important thing as i said that most of the good dramas have been adapted and in fact most of the good dramas have been adapted multiple times so you are using same play and you are creating newer narratives okay so initially uh, we talked about hamlet so this is uh, the poster that you could see this is the longest version of hamlet drama and hamlet is considered to be the longest drama written by shakespeare this drama was 242 minutes uh, long like this particular adaptation of hamlet was 242 minutes long it was directed by kenneth branagh and he himself played the lead role of hamlet and branagh tried to maintain a complete loyalty to the original drama okay like that that was his objective that i want to recreate hamlet so he didn't even change a single dialogue but it it is interesting to see hamlet in a kind of colorful clothes okay and there are different sequences available 
Heather we already talked about 2014 Hindi film by Vishal Bhardwaj and that film is 160 minutes long so like 80 minutes less than the original drama if we follow Bara, Branagh's Hamlet as a kind of criteria plus here the drama is not purely about Hamlet but it's more about the political scenario in which Hamlet is suffering and probably the way people are making use of the youth and uh, certain political ideologies. Okay. So it was not a film about Hamlet but it was a film about Kashmir and that's why there was one more book involved when the script was being developed. Yet another adaptation from Hamlet, a 2018 film by Claire McCarthy, which is 107 minutes long and it is titled Ophelia. Ophelia was the woman who loved Hamlet, but at a certain moment of the drama, Hamlet kills his brother, her brother, and then she turns lunatic and she dies. Now, this particular film is purely from the perspective of Ophelia. So, again, as I said in earlier slide, that you are adapting, considering a character as the most important aspect and you develop the entire screenplay surrounding that character. So, obviously, when you change the narrative and change the focal character of the narrative, you will have to make a lot of changes. Because everywhere Hamlet was present, Ophelia wasn't. And everywhere Ophelia was present, Hamlet wasn't. So, Ophelia will have a very, very different kind of perspective on what Hamlet was doing. And that is where we are trying to see the life of Hamlet from an outsider's perspective. We have like in almost every adaptations, we are basically looking at Hamlet from Hamlet's perspective. Well, this film talks about the life of Hamlet from somebody else's perspective. And there is, this is 2000 film directed by Michael Almereda and it is called Hamlet. Now, in this case, there is no king, there is no prince, but Hamlet is a son of a billionaire, a corporate tycoon, and he got skilled, that is the father of Hamlet got skilled, and Hamlet has to return from his college, and Hamlet is basically trying to um, learn filmmaking. So he always has uh, the camera in his hand. So here you don't find uh, the ghost of uh, the king who will tell the Hamlet that uh, someone who has killed him. Rather, here they are checking the security cameras and through security cameras and video recordings, they get to know about uh, the killing of his father. And in the, what we call, <clears throat> final sequence where uh, Hamlet invites this play uh, uh, and they started playing there to recreate the murder of his father. So that thing is also modified into a film. Hamlet is showing a film to his uncle to get to know his, uh, what we call, uh, response to this particular event. So now here the ha Hamlet is in modern time. Hamlet is using camera. He is not a what we call a, a, a prince. So he is not above the law. So he can't simply go and kill someone. Right. So now you will have to recreate the same drama, same narrative in a newer way considering the modern time. All these and there are a few more films are adapted from 
same Shakespearean tragedy, and that is the tragedy of Hamlet. But they all portray the tragedy from different perspectives in terms of characters, times, and space. Okay, like in case of Hather, also we don't have a ghost. Okay, rather a specific character is added, uh, who is uh, called Ruh Taz. So Ruh literally means uh, soul or spirit. And that particular character comes and tells Heather how his father got killed. Okay. So which is again a kind of addition that the director is making to fit the sequence or fit uh, the story into modern times. But then uh, in the actual drama, the spirit uh, came only twice and just uh, visible to the Hamlet and just told him the story about uh, his mother. While in case of Heather, you have the character Ruthas. So if he's a character, he's also governing the narrative. He's not just a passive uh, character who would appear twice and vanish. He's there, very much there in the entire story and modifying the actions of uh, the Hadder. So these changes are not just random changes, but the changes are made so that uh, the narrative of the film becomes more convincing and acceptable. Okay. Moving forward, uh, I'm talking about one, again, one Gujarati uh, drama from which a Gujarati film was made how it is used uh, uh, to create a kind of social commentary. Okay. But more than creating a social commentary, uh, this particular film was also a commentary on the medium of cinema. Okay. So this uh, film was actually made in 1980 by uh, Ketan Mehta. It's a Gujarati film. And in a very first uh, frame of the film uh, Ketan Mehta writes that this film is dedicated to Asai Thakur and Bertolt Brecht we all know who is Bertolt Brecht because Bertolt, Bertolt Brecht's uh, Brechtian theatre has uh, what we call everlasting impact on cinema but we don't know who is Asai Thakur Asai Thakur was a person a Gujarati person who invented the drama form called Bhavai. A very famous drama form, Bhavai. Okay. And it is basically performed in uh, different uh, festivals uh, of Gujarat. In Vadodara specifically, in my city, uh, the most authentic Bhavai is played during Navratri. Okay. In a, one specific place. So, Bhavai was a drama form invented by Asai Thakur to comment on social issues. It was not just a form of entertainment. It was primarily used as a uh, kind of uh, what you call social work uh, and social empowerment uh, kind of form. Okay. So, all the major issues of our society were basically performed in the form of uh, Bhavai. So in a very first, uh, what we call frame, Ketan Mehta made it obvious that this particular film and the narrative of the film is uh, dedicated to Asai Thakur and Bertolt Brecht. Asai Thakur was a progenitor of Bhavai dance drama form popular in the state of Gujarat, India. It was based on the drama, this particular film was based on the drama of the same title written by Dhiruban Patel. And the original drama, the plot deals with the operation of Harizan community, a community of scheduled caste, and how they have to move from one village to another to save their lives and for their basic requirements because they are uh, untouchables uh, 
they cannot live in the village or they are not allowed to stay in a specific village so they'll have to move from one place to another place and they had to really struggle for their uh, daily needs so this very very serious subject of untouchability was dealt with humor and pinch of folklores in the film okay. but see ketan mehta doesn't stay lawyer loyal to the drama in the sense that he doesn't just talk about untouchability he talks about untouchability but uh, he made certain changes okay. so through the editing and bricolage director ketan mehta makes a statement in terms of the conflict between oppressors and oppressed that he is not thinking in terms of caste but he is dividing these two caste as oppressor and oppressed so that that particular narrative can also be extended to other types of narratives where the oppression is involved okay. so he uses uh, the freedom struggle uh, as bricolage where the british people were attacking the indian freedom fighters and there were other such uh, sequences used in the uh, last part of the movie to give that idea that he is not strictly talking about uh, the untouchability okay whether it is a really a strategic move to expand the uh, theme of the drama or Uh, whether it is a kind of uh, move to be politically correct to get a film good release in our country so that's altogether a different issue but he changes the drama he plays with the idea of drama and that is where uh, our concern comes following uh, brachian theater he also breaks the fourth wall very deliberately and multiple times in the movie okay. for example i am using two frames here uh, the first frame uh, here you can see nasiruddin shah and i i forgot the name of the heroine uh, so here he is king and she is queen and they belong to the upper caste here nasiruddin shah is talking to the audience that don't laugh rabbit is a clever animal okay so he is telling this to audience not to the queen on the other hand we can see here um, ms smita patil and uh, i i forgot again his name he was the hero of the film okay so both of them were uh, horizons both of them were untouchable touchables and this sequence comes after they faced a severe attack by the villagers and they were basically um, using bandages for the people who got injured in that attack and there they say all <clears throat> out there who stare at us from their uh, con cocooned darkness okay so they are directly talking to the audience that you are simply observing the kind of oppression that we are facing but you are not doing anything they are trying to involve the audience and these are i'm just using two frames there are many such uh, sequences where these characters specifically later parts smita patil and the hero they uh, deliberately talk to the audience uh, and bring the attention of the audience and involve the audience in the Uh, narrative so that that was done in 1980 okay uh, after that uh, ketan mehta did not make any other gujarati film that was the only and first film made by gujarat uh, ketan mehta that was in gujarati then he started making films in hindi but the kind of experimentation that we could see in this gujarati film uh, we could not see that in ketan mehta's later films unfortunately then uh, there is one more aspect in terms of play 
that we don't adapt play into cinema but we try to convert cinema and present it like play okay so we are basically adapting the form rather than the content okay say for example 1957 film by alfred hitchcock which was based on 1929 play by patrick hamilton it's called the rope okay and this is again a very very interesting film it uh, it is somewhere um, related with Nishian philosophy of man and superman birdman uh, very uh, what we call contemporary film and i think most of us must have seen the movie very popular film uh, 2014 and directed by alessandro inaritu now both these films that is rope and the birdman are made in a single take single take format as if a drama is going on at a stage and we as an audience are having a live experience. Both the films also invite the viewers to develop an intertextual reading okay? because there are comments where you will have to uh, have the intertextual reading. You There are philosophical comments, there are comments about the drama form. Okay? There are comments about the humanity, there is, there is comments especially in rope their comments about uh, what do you call uh, a kind of civilized or perfect human. Okay, So we are directly uh, challenged to um, get into the discourse of the cinema. Uh, 2003 film called Dogville by Lars von Trier. Uh, Lars von Trier is one of the most, uh, what we call, uh, experiment filmmaker every in every other film you'll find something interesting something philosophical in this specific film he uses uh, what you can see in the lower image he uses this kind of map like uh, set okay. in this film dog Ville, director uses that stage like structure where houses roads etc. of the town of Dogville. Dogville was the name of the town in which this image is the uh, entire town of Dogville. Okay. And every action that we can see in that film is happening in this particular frame. Okay. So everything, all the buildings, all the roads, all the gardens, everything is marked. There are no walls. Okay. There is a border that distinguishes that this is a road and this is a house. Okay. So there are yellow border, white border. Okay. There are no walls and that means the scene is focusing on one character. Okay. The character is delivering dialogue but in the background someone in the house is doing something that's also visible to the audience. Okay. So this kind of minimalist approach to cinematography also invite the reader to concentrate on the performances of the characters as we experience in the play. Okay. Plus, it is a, a, a kind of challenge to the idea of, uh, let's say, that you cannot make a film without good locations. Okay. There are there are filmmakers uh, who were unable to make good films because they didn't have good locations or they could not find right type of environment. I, I heard, I read it somewhere that when Sakti Samanta was making Kati Patang, at the same time, uh, Satyajit Ray was also making uh, Kanchanjunga. So Satyajit Ray completed his shooting and they st started going back and Sakti Samanta is still waiting because he wanted uh, the atmosphere to clear up so that he can start shooting. Well, Satyajit Ray completed the shooting in the same atmosphere. Okay. So, that was like too much dependency on uh, the backgrounds and good locations uh, and good, what we call, uh, using good houses and sets. Okay. 
that is also being questioned in terms of developing a kind of challenging or uh, intriguing narrative for a filmmaker. So yeah, that's all from my side for today. So we'll come back and we are 